So in this problem, we want to solve the moment of inertia about the x-axis for this area. The area is formed by this polygon, but it does have a 75 millimeter radius hole right there in the middle. We want to find the moment of inertia about the x-axis. Now, of course, this is a composite area, as you can see. Um, it won't be really easy. I'm not sure if we even can come up with an equation that describes all the curves in this, um, in this shape. However, we can still find each of these shape if we each of these shapes, right? If we split it up into multiple components. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna solve for the moment of inertia by dividing this shape into several different components. So this type of area is what we call a composite area. If you look at this polygon with a hole in, in, in the middle, um, are there any shapes that you think you can recognize? And, and when I say recognize, really, I, I mean easy shapes whose moments of inertia are easy to find. What do you think? It's just a square triangle and circle. Yeah, pretty much, right? So we can have a rectangle here. We have a triangle that we can recognize and also a circle. So if I were to draw these uh, composite, um, all these components, the components of this composite area, I would have a rectangle. And this rectangle, if you can't really see it, you can see that it actually represents this section that I am marking down. And everything inside that section. So we have our rectangle. We have a triangle. I think the triangle is a little bit easier to note, right? The triangle represents everything that I am marking right now. And we have a circle. And the circle, as you can see, just represents this hole in the shape. Now, there's a couple of things we need to note. The shape is formed by the rectangle, the triangle, but the circle is actually not part of the shape. The circle is actually the part that, the portion that we're removing from this shape. So if we want to solve this problem, we know that the moment of inertia for composite areas is equal to the sum of the moments of inertia of their individual segments. However, because the circle is not part of this shape, we're going to actually have to subtract the moment of inertia of that circle from all of the segments. So we're going to end up having a rectangle, a triangle, and we're going to subtract the circular portion. And in order to solve this, I think it'd be best if we can first figure out what the dimensions of these shapes are. For this rectangle, we can see that we have a base of 200 millimeters and a height of 300 millimeters. For this triangle, we have a height of 300 millimeters and a base of 150 millimeters. And for the circle, we have a radius of 75 millimeters. So let's go ahead and find the moment of inertia. You're not really required to memorize the values of the moments of inertia, particularly from the x-axis. Instead, it's actually easier to look up the moments of inertia about a centroidal axis. So when we cover the moment of inertia about a centroidal axis, we mentioned that that is pretty much the best thing to remember for each shape. Because then the axis or the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis doesn't depend on where the shape is located. It's actually taken from a dimension or from a location that is dependent on the shape itself. If you don't remember the back of the book the back of your book actually includes the different moments of inertia about the centroidal axis for some of these very common shapes. And you can look them up. So we're going to start with the most common one, which is the rectangle, the rectangular shape, because we've already solved several examples where we have the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis for a rectangular shape. So starting with my section, my rectangular section, which I will just call my section number one. 
I get that for that rectangular section, the moment of inertia about the centroidal x-axis, that's an axis that passes through the centroid of the shape. That moment of inertia we know is equal to one over 12 base times i cubed. And again, if you don't remember, it's in your book, in the back of your book. For this shape, my base is 200. My height is 300, so this will be 1 over 12, 200 millimeters, times 300 millimeters cubed. Plugging those into your calculator. We get a moment of inertia of 4, 5, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 zeros. So 450 million millimeters to the power of four. Because I want it to look a little bit uh, cleaner, I'm just going to write 450 times 10 to the power of six millimeters to the power of four. There is one problem here, right? This is the moment of inertia about its centroidal axis but we want to find the moment of inertia about the x-axis for the entire shape. So we need to apply some sort of correction factor that will allow us to convert or translate this moment of inertia from the centroidal axis to the x-axis. Does anybody remember what that correction factor was, what that theorem was called? The parallel axis theorem. That's correct. Parallel axis theorem tells us that the moment of inertia about the x-axis is equal to the area of the shape times the distance to the centroid squared plus the centroidal moment of inertia about the x-axis. In this case, the area of my rectangle is 200 times 300. The distance to the centroid is the distance between the x-axis and the centroid of the rectangle, which will be 150 millimeters. Remember that the centroid of a rectangle is at its center. So this multiplied by 150 squared. And to this, we add our centroidal moment of inertia of 450 million. Solving all this, we get the following. So we get 180 million, assuming that I counted the zeros correctly. Maybe I didn't count the zeros correctly. Let me just write, write them down. So 18000000000. No, I didn't count them correctly. All right, so 180 or 18 plus eight zeros. So it's actually 1.8 billion millimeters to the power of four. So that is the moment of inertia, but only for this rectangular segment. We also have to find the moments of inertia for the additional segments in order to get the composite moment of inertia. For the triangular portion, we know that the centroidal moment of inertia is 1 over 36 base times i cubed. I could be wrong, so somebody can double check that and let me know if that's not correct. But I think it, I think it could be 1 over 36 base times i cubed. And for this triangle, we know that the base is 150. And we also know that the height is 300. So multiplying all these for our triangle, we get the following centroidal moment of inertia.
Assuming that I counted the zeros correctly, we get 112.5 million millimeters to the power of four. Again, we have the same problem here. This is the moment of inertia about a centroidal axis. That is an x-axis that passes through the centroid of the triangle. We want to translate that moment of inertia to that about the x-axis. So we apply the parallel axis theorem, which tells us that the moment of inertia about the x-axis is equal to the area of the shape, in this case, the area of the triangle, times the distance between the x-axis and the centroid of that triangle squared. So the area of my triangle is going to be one half base times height. The distance to the centroid, because this is a triangle and we're starting from the big side, from the big wall, then the distance to the centroid will be one third of the entire height. However, let's recall that this y bar, this distance to the centroid is squared. So we're gonna have to square this term. And to this, we add our centroidal moment of inertia of 112.5 million. Now we should be able to find the moment of inertia about the x-axis for this triangular section. So what do we have? We have if I'm counting my zeros correctly, we have 337.5 million. Yep. And that is the moment of inertia, but only for the triangular section. Now we got to find the moment of inertia for the circular section. Now we, we have, we've, we've rarely done circular sections here. So I don't quite remember the centroidal moment of inertia for a circular section. Can anybody search that in your book and remind me what the moment of inertia for a circular section is? It's one fourth pi r to the fourth. And that's for a centroidal axis. So the axis passes through a centroid of the circle. Yes. Okay. So one over four pi radius to the power of four. In this case, my radius is 75 millimeters. So we get 24 million. Millimeters to the power of four. I think at this point, you, you may be, you may already have start to notice that this process of breaking down a shape into simpler components, the real challenging part is deciding which shapes to use and how to use them. Um, Yesterday and today, we weren't through a more complicated problem where we had to do a little bit of work adding and subtracting shapes to land out our shape. But once you actually know how to break up your shapes, it's pretty much a matter of looking up moments of inertia for a centroidal axis and then transferring them by using the parallel axis theorem. So let's do that. Let's use the parallel axis theorem to translate the moment of inertia that passes through the centroid of this axis to one that passes through the x axis. The area of a circle is pi radius squared. So pi times 75 squared. 
The distance to the center is the distance between the x-axis and the center of the circle, which is 150 millimeters. And then we add to that our centroidal moment of inertia of 24.85 times 10 to the six millimeters to the power of four. And we get 422.5 million millimeters to the power of four. The last step, as you may already be familiar with, is the easiest one to find the moment of inertia about the x axis for this entire shape. All we have to do is add or subtract all of our moments of inertia. So we have 1.8 billion. plus 338 million but because the circle is not part of this shape we actually have to subtract that moment of inertia so it'll be minus 442 million This gives us 1,695,000,000 millimeters to the power of four. Yeah, that is how we find the moment of inertia about the X axis for this shape. Any questions with this problem? All right, if there are no questions, then you see that's essentially solving a problem like this, the challenging part is pretty much figuring out how to break the problem down. But once you have an idea of how to do this, Solving it is just about looking up tables and applying the parallel axis theorem, assuming that you know how to apply the parallel axis theorem.